CTAG Clinic. My name is Dr. Mike Lloyd and I'm the clinic director. Today I'm going to be discussing dissociative amnesia. We're not going to talk about dissociative fugue, we'll leave that for another day, and there'll be another video after this which will talk a little bit more about some of the uh, ways of managing and treating this condition within therapy. So to start with, it's important that um, to know that dissociative amnesia is one of the most common forms of dissociation that we see clinically. It's present within many other conditions and this is where things can get a bit tricky because it's important if we're undertaking a diagnostic assessment to make sure that we don't diagnose one thing instead of another. So dissociative amnesia needs to be seen within the context of a broader spectrum of dissociation but it can be very prominent in conditions such as dissociative identity disorder, other specified dissociative disorders for example. So we, we need to make sure that if we are going to diagnose dissociative amnesia on its own that we, we're not diagnosing instead of one of the other conditions. This is where the assessment is important and the SCID-D, the Structured Clinical Interview for Dissociative Disorders, is very useful because that helps us understand each different section of dissociation in its own right and we look to see where the main diagnostic criteria are actually being met. To begin with, dissociative amnesia is different from forgetting. For example, and this is how I might explain it in therapy, is um, a person who forgets what TV programs they watched two weeks ago or what meals they've had a week or two ago, that's normal forgetting, day-to-day -day type things. Dissociative amnesia is where it's more than ordinary forgetting, is that there are significant problems with a person's recall of events, of experience, of feelings, just things from way back in the past or from recent events. There are many forms of amnesia and we have to know which we're looking at to make sure that we cor we're correctly diagnosed. The first part of this is to make sure that we rule out other reasons. Typical examples of this could be alcohol use, um, street drug use, head injury or other medical conditions. So one of the key characteristics, and this, this takes place early in the assessment, certainly using the SCID-D, before we even get to the sections on dissociation, is to make sure that we take those factors into account. Because it's very common for people with any of those to have significant memory losses. Those might be either short-term, long-term, and they can be permanent losses of memory. This does not necessarily mean that we're looking at dissociative amnesia. Other types of amnesia include things like post-traumatic amnesia, infantile amnesia, retrograde and anterograde amnesia, and all of these need to be considered separately. Generally, by the time a person gets to undertaking the SCID-D, we will have tried to make sure that those things aren't present anyway, so ruling out medical conditions, one of the first things that's being done in the assessment process. There's some really good information on dissociative amnesia. NHS England and traumadissociation.com have good quality information, validated and clear to read. They're there to help people understand the broader aspects of dissociation. So I would encourage people to look at those sites if they want to know a little bit more about it. It's okay. useful to go through the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for this. That's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And just to sort of clarify the, the key factors within this, and then I'll go on to explain some of those in a little bit more detail. The first of these then. Criteria A is an inability to recall important autobiographic information, usually of a traumatic or stressful nature, that is inconsistent with ordinary forgetting. Ordinary forgetting is very different from amnesia. When we forget things, we tend to forget details. Play, you know, small details, things that are lost to our memory because they need to be lost to our memory because otherwise they would clog up our memory and we would never be able to get anywhere because we'd have too much information floating around. These are things like maybe who we are, where we, sh where we are, recalling events around us, recalling important events. So there's a difference between remembering what socks you may have worn on your wedding day and remembering whether you got married at all. So one is forgetting, one is amnesia. Criterion B, 
The symptoms cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational or other important areas of functioning. We know that everybody forgets things. That doesn't stop us from working, it doesn't stop us from having relationship, it doesn't stop us from functioning in the activities. Amnesia can do. So for an example, a person might have an, uh, a plan of what they intend to do during the day, they might have a list, they might have a series of chores or activities or work tasks, places they need to go, people they need to meet up with. They can then find themselves at the end of the day and none of those things have taken place and they can't account for what's happened. And that could be minutes or it could be hours. Very rarely this can go into weeks, months and even years. Mostly though what we see is people lose that track of time for activities during the day. And if we add that to losses of significant chunks of life in the past, Again, this is different from infantile and amnesia where we generally don't remember things that happened very early in childhood, certainly as babies and infants. We're talking about, say, primary school, high school ages where there are significant losses to memory. Criterion C, the disturbance is not attributable to the physiological effects of a substance, e.g. alcohol or other drug abuse or medication, or a neurological or other medical condition, or of a closed head injury, traumatic brain injury. As stated, those are things that damage the brain, either temporarily or permanently. Those do cause amnesic effects, and we are not looking at that in the context of dissociative amnesia. And the last criterion, the disturbance is not better explained by dissociative identity disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, acute stress disorder, somatic symptom disorder, or major or mild neurocognitive disorders. Again, this is about ruling out other things. So if a person is likely to have DID, we wouldn't be diagnosing dissociative amnesia. We would say that there is a significant memory aspect to the DID. And nearly always when you diagnose something like DID, there is going to be significant dissociative amnesia present. So there's no point diagnosing dissociative amnesia if a person has a more serious dissociative condition. Some of the characteristics we look for in clinical settings that may lead a person to have a diagnostic assessment for dissociation. Remember, a lot of the time people are in therapy and they start discussing aspects of the life and the therapist might start going, okay, it looks like there is something else going on here. So you came to talk about depression or anxiety or phobias, OCD, but what you're describing are aspects of memory loss that I can't really account for. That seems a bit unusual, we need to think more about that. That might lead someone to the assessment for dissociation. And things we might talk about are being able, being finding yourself in a place where you cannot account for, you do not either know the reason for your journey or you cannot account for any aspect of how you got there. That's different from forgetting um, routes that you might drive on or be on a train or a bus from where you, you can't really account for the journey because you travel on it every day commuting to and from work or to and from family or friends. That's very common, that's not dissociative amnesia. Dissociative amnesia is when you simply cannot account for any aspect of the journey or you do not even know why you travel to that place or you might find yourself in a place and you don't even know where it is. Dissociative amnesia doesn't necessarily mean that a person loses all negative or traumatic events. That's very common. Lots of people say that they can't remember things that happened but they have a sense that it probably was not a good thing. People can remember or forget bad or good things in their lives. So it can feel a bit random at times. So people talk about whole periods of time that they've lost, they cannot account for that time, they don't know what happened, but they know they're in a certain town or a certain house or in a certain school or wherever it may be. And they can remember what's called snapshots. So people talk about glimpses or aspects of memories, but there's not a consistent story that takes place. A lot of the time, this is where, as diagnosing therapists or clinicians, this is where we start thinking, okay, there may be dissociation present. When a person starts talking about their childhood or their background and they lose track of things or they become overly emotional in a very scared or frightened way or they become hugely avoidant of wanting to talk about aspects of that. That sometimes tells us that there's traumatic dissociation taking place. That gives us some reason for why the amnesia might be present. 
what we're looking at there is the sense that the amnesia is there to try and help and protect the person. So this is called a disorder in that it's, it's a diagnosed psychiatric condition, but there may be a usefulness to it. So it's really key to understand if a person has dissociative amnesia, the purpose of that amnesia is to protect them largely from traumatic memories. The brain isn't necessarily always brilliant at being able to filter that out, so sometimes it just wipes out whole chunks of memory or hides it or compartmentalizes that memory in other places in the person's brain and, and that affects their functioning in everyday life. For example, they may not be able to remember conversations that happened a week ago because the brain is used to forgetting things deliberately many, many years ago and it's maintaining that pattern. This is where we start thinking in terms of the diagnostic criteria and we look for those impairments, i.e. the way that this gets in the way of a person's life without any of the medical conditions or physical conditions that may cause memory loss and that are explainable within the context of a person's trauma history. We rule out stress disorders because anxiety often leads to forgetting. The more we become anxious, the more stressed out we are, the more we forget things that are happening around us. We have to rule that out. <clears throat> a lot of people with dissociative amnesia also have a lot of stress and anxiety in their lives and the assessment process is just there to try and make sure that we can uh, accurately place that person in terms of a diagnostic criteria. That then leads to a treatment that then can then help them. And again, I'll discuss that in another video. So I hope this has been helpful. There are some really good uh, websites, there's some very good information out there for people to look at. And it's really important to understand that dissociative amnesia is a part of a spectrum of dissociative disorders. It's often seen within the context of other dissociative conditions such as OSDD and DID, but it can be present purely on its own and it can be treated on its own in exactly the same way as we approach other, other dissociative conditions. I hope this video has been helpful to you. Um, it's a very big topic. I'm not going to cover everything in short videos like this. It's, this is an introduction to the topic of dissociative amnesia. If you'd like more information on this and if you want to continue looking at content from the channel, please like and subscribe and that gives you notifications on what is going to be coming up next. So I will see you in another video and in the meantime, take great care.